it's recording now and it's broadcasting now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the seventh lecture in the anger management communication solution series of lectures. Um, a lot of exciting things are happening within our program, um, and one of these days we're gonna we're gonna give it uh, we're gonna get a status conference and we talk about what uh, some of the things we're we'll doing here. Um, this is a plug. Uh, the the uh, two of the books that I'm, I'm reading in, in this next couple of weeks is the Science of Evil by uh, Simon Baron Cohen, who looks at empathy and the origins of cruelty. Great book. Um, one of the things I love about this book is that uh, he goes very into depth in depth as to the the genetics behind empathy and and, and, and how important language is to the entire process recognition um, and very good stuff um, specifically he had an entire section looking at the autism and looking at the genetics of autism and how that affects all of us. Uh, because you know we you know there's 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 something similar that we all kind of have to deal with is it trait or is genetic it or trait and actually you have this interplay between genetics nature nurture genetics and environment and they do a lot of twin studies you know uh, where they looked at uh, what what are, what are the factors that goes into uh, psychopathology and uh, and a lot of it is language based. A lot of it is language-based, and that's the thing that really gets to me. It's how much of it is language-based, or limitations on language, and and how do you recover from trauma, and how important language is to that process. Um, but it it is it is, it is fascinating stuff. But our lecture uh, today has to go into do with uh, anger management in treaty acceptance, and the and the the importance of acceptance in managing loss. Acceptance is a cognitive skill. Let me repeat what I said. Acceptance is a cognitive skill. Being able to look at something and don't re react, but simply to smile and to accept it. That's the tip of the iceberg. But there's so much stuff that's happening below the tip of that iceberg that points to intelligence, points to transactional agency as, as defined by your ability to pay attention, to act intentionally, to know when you've accomplished what you're trying to accomplish. And the fourth piece of that is containment, knowing what other people want from you and what you need to provide for them. That's an essential part of our program where we talk about transactional agency. And so there's a power there. And so we again, we get back to this issue of power versus force, force versus power. And most human beings, when they talk about uh, power, they're actually talking about the power that they see or the so-called power they see in nature. And we just had a storm go through the, uh, the, 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 the southeast and northeast section of the, of the country. Mm -hmm. And it caused a lot of damage and destruction. And then, you remember what they named the storm? Hurricane it was Hur Hurricane Matthew, I think. It was Matthew. It was the newest one. Yeah, Matthew. Matthew was a, was, a, was, a, was, a, was, a, was a tough dude, man. He just came through and just kind of tore things up. And so mm -hmm. that's the kind of power human beings like to think of as power. But it's not really power, it's force. It's force, it's force. It has an instrumental nature to it. And in our program, in our protocols, we talk about looking at power and the meaning of power. But power is not transactional. Um, mm -hmm. It only gives the appearance of being transactional. Power is much deeper than that. And power requires acceptance. You accept stuff. And it's amazing how when you're willing to accept stuff, how you can you can take care of not only other people, but you can take care of yourself. It's in, it's it's intellect, it's intelligence, in order not to act out and to 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 approach things in in a in a more nuanced manner. It's a sign of high intelligence. Um, again, God is a wonderful God, and He's given us this wonderful freedom called choice. And sometimes the choices we make in life can be really messed up, very bad. bad choice. But but then there's also rational choice, which is a good choice, you know, choice that is based on, on on rational thinking and understanding. Now, civil groups program um, and anger management communication solution has some very important foundational pieces. There's an ethos to civil groups program, and uh, one of the things we talk about is that just to exist is nothing. 
Yeah, we are a program and we believe greatly in existentialism. There must be existence before essence. That is the foundational piece for existentialism. There must be existence before essence, before anything comes from it. So to just to exist is nothing at all. Um, and, to, and to become and be something is where you add value and, and, you, and you overcome nothingness. Nothingness. I mean, it's, when you interact with a lot of people, the part, the part that really gets to most of us is that their in interaction means nothing because there's nothing there. And that's that what overwhelms us, you know. That, and, 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 and multiple writers over multiple centuries have talked about nausea, the feeling of terror, the anxiety which comes in the, in, in the acknowledgement that when you deal with other human beings, there's nothing there, nothingness. And so um, the good news is that being and becoming is where you add value to your life. Um, again, there needs to be existence before essence, but you have to work at it. It requires choice and it requires action. Now the question is what informs choice? <coughs> what informs choice? <coughs> You know, sometimes your choice is informed by your economics, your circumstances. Sometimes your choice is, 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 uh, is determined by what, what people give you. And so uh, Pierre Bordeaux talked about our fields. We, we all have fields. You know, um, and I, today, today uh, one, of my, one of my program workers called me and said, Mr. King, we have this problem. And, you know, uh, I sat down for a minute and I said, why is she calling me Mr. King? I said, Mr. King is at home sleeping. He's not here. Or smoking weed. No, You're Dr. King. Mr. King. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Where's my pen? Let me drop. Let me have a pen drop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't smoke weed, boy. I don't smoke weed. I don't need it. I, 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 I don't need. I don't need. I don't need the hassle that goes with smoking weed. It doesn't give me anything. Uh, so, so. Um, the, the question has always become, you know, what is the most important player in history? And the, one of the big conflicts existed between uh, Kierkegaard and Hegel was to what is the most important element that determines our history and our historical references? For, uh, for Kierkegaard, it was the individual, the subjective individual. The Greeks also believed that, that the most important thing for democracy and for everything else is about our subjective individual individuality trumping the, uh, the, the powers of gods, kings, and empires. This is part of our, our mantra in, in terms of civil groups program. Now, um, Hegel talked about the state that's being very important. He said, without the state, there's nothing. That's why when you had all these spate of shootings, of, of cops being killed, and uh, all, of the, all of the very intelligent people, black, white, whatever, realized that police officers are constitutional officers. And they are going. They are needed. They are absolutely needed, and they need to be able to do their jobs and to do it professionally. But the whole notion that you're not going to have police officers or structure or laws and justice is is nonsense, because it gives contour and meanings to our lives. The state is very important. That's Hegelian metaphysics. The state is very important. So Hegel talked about the state being the most important thing. Oh, in, in American history right now and for the last 30 years, we have this phenomenon called uh, um, American revanchist conservatism, which is not real conservatism because real conservatism is about governance, is the philosophy of governance. But with revanchism, um, the, uh, certain conservatives who have agendas, and a lot of these agendas are motivated by racism, hatred, animosity for certain groups. Um, they, they want to seize the organs of power in order to, to, to control or damage or to make America great again. You know, going back to an era where, where things were much more understandable. You know, like a, 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 like a, a Rockwell painting. You know, the Rockwell, you know those series of paintings from the 30s? Beautiful series, man. Maybe, maybe somebody can tell me, was, was, did you ever see a black person in a Rockwell painting? No. Nope. Have you ever? I may be wrong, but I've never seen. Only seen yeah, that America. Where, 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 yeah. yeah. I've, I've never seen it. But yeah. you get beautiful paintings. Though. Yeah, but it's always there the are beautiful setting. paintings, but they don't necessarily represent the true America. Yeah. Right. You know, and so you don't see yourself as part of that process. 
and so and so that that becomes uh, that becomes part of our uh, of our um, conflict. So in our in our in our in our program, we believe it's a moot point because the truth of the matter is that the individual does matter. Individual leaders do matter. They do rise to the. They do become historical figures of great significance. And one of the debates that we're having right now has to do with um, Obamacare, which was really uh, Romney Care, which was really initially a heritage foundation idea of, of market. A conservative. Conservative. It was a conservative idea. plan to, yeah. to put market forces to, to, to look at the, market, the, the, the delivery of healthcare services. Now, uh, people are just celebrating the fact that the I think the silver plan of Obamacare is going up like twenty percent, mm -hmm. and everybody knows that if you need a single payer system. I mean, mm -hmm. if if that's what the entire world has, that's the efficiency of the system. You mm -hmm. can't bring profit into healthcare. It's been proved to work. It, it, it does. It does doesn't work very well. Yeah. You know, you have to do other things in order to manage cost. Obamacare, for what it was, you know, did bring down the cost. That 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 that, that trajectory. That was the thing that really got to Obama. That's why he made the decision. It was the trajectory of healthcare it costs. Was it was gonna it was gonna eat up everything. Yeah. But they kind of flattened the curve. But I think that the next stage, uh, Madam President Hillary Clinton, she's gonna put in a single payment system, yeah, so. and she may be able to do it because, for one thing, she's got the ethnicity and the and the and the age and the and the and the moral authority, power in order to do that kind of thing, which Obama, they tried to damage this fellow and, and, uh, and limit his ability to make those changes. Yeah. And so that that is some that is that is something to look at in the future. Anyway, some other foundational pieces of looking at uh, um, our program, civil groups program. Um, we talk, of course, about there must be existence before essence. We talk about the importance of existence. In facilitating choice in being and becoming, being and becoming requires choices. Okay, and, and to avoid nothingness, mean and meaninglessness, one has to be and to and become. So we talk about in our program the importance of intimacy in this process. We always talk about intimacy in five acts: intimacy, uh, creating those intimate spaces where you can take care of yourself and others. We talk about intimacy as involving five acts. We talk about intimacy involving storage. Of eros, philea, uh, xenia, the care of strangers in our midst, and of course, the fifth one is agape. Uh, again, part of this process requires conscious development, and conscious development is progressive and it's ontological, and 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 and, and it requires um, um, the establishing of moral spaces. You start out with moral force. Which becomes moral power, and it tracks along our level of conscious development. When you're a child, you want mastery. You want to control things. You want to break toys and control things. And it's all about force. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It's all about force. Then you go on to power unto death. Again, it's about what force. I'm going to make you do that stuff. You know, you, I always love it with aesthetics. You know, women walk around here and they got all these nice dresses on, and they're like, sashing. I'm going to force you to do that. Man. You buy me the pink clothes." Because you're gonna want some of this. That's force. <laughs> you know, that's force. Yeah. That's force. But the problem with that, with force, is that you know, um, you create a space uh, of of of, of prosecutorial anxiety. You know, you want to become part of something, and so you become you become you become uh, overwhelmed. So what happens with pros with with power force onto that is that. Everybody realizes that you're not all that in the bag of chips because you have to create a moral space because guess what? We all get old. We all have vulnerabilities that mm -hmm. can be exploited by other people. And so prosecutorial anxiety is a, is a, is a, is a because it forces you to, uh, to go to a certain place and you go into relationships. You go into relationships. So you have power unto death. You encounter prosecutorial anxiety, and you rush headlong into master-slave relationships, where it's an unfortunate term, but it makes sense, you know, when you begin to think about it. Because I, well, I've been in master-slave relationship where I've been slave. The first one, the, the first one I, I, I'm aware of is, is is with my father and my mom. They were my masters, and I was their slave. I followed along, and they created a wonderful experience for me to learn and to grow and to and to develop consciously. Again, choice. 
is the most important thing that we have because it informs our choices. And if you're in a master-slave relation, it, it, uh, those, those, those choices are, infor are informed by your moral, the moral spaces in your life, the moral, uh, the, the moral force and eventually the moral power that, that you have to deal with. And so it becomes very important. So in terms of conscious development, we go from mastery to power unto death to master-slave relationship, and then we begin to accept. And the first, the, first, the first kernel of that power that we begin to experience is with Stoicism. Stoicism. That's why they, they teach Stoicism as a philosoph philosophical construct to, the, to, to soldiers. To be able to accept is the start of true power. Because you're willing to accept less intimacy in a relationship, and you bring your own power onto the on, into play by by allowing others to be, you become. You know, you accept. Uh, so you basically, my father. You know, as 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 I as my father got older, I know all of his vulnerabilities, but I never challenged him because I want my father to be there for me. And so I became a stoic. I accepted what my father's authority was. Sometimes even when I didn't, I didn't necessarily agree with it. So I always, I always say to to kids, I say, you know, mothers are always right, even when they're wrong. Parents are always right, even when they're wrong, because stoicism is the first step of your of your, of your acquiring true, true power, the power of self-control. The only power you have in life is self-control. You know, when you talk about force, is forcing other people to do something. And people can always say, you know, I'm not doing that. You have no power in that case. The only power that you have is power over yourself and over your moral spaces, and your moral conviction. So moral, morality informs, informs your choices, okay? Uh, so in, in terms of, again, we, we're kind of doing a quick surveillance of uh, the Seville Group program and some of the foundational pieces. In our, in, our, in our program, the house becomes very important, as the house is represented in, in, the, in the Lord's Prayer. The house, as a metaphor, uh, is transcendent and ubiquitous in human history. Think about it. You can't think of any human settlement where there is not a house, a house where you repair yourself, where you seek shelter, where you can raise kids, and you can require, you can require those intimate spaces to take care of yourself and others. So the house is very important because in, in terms of history, I always look at it as scaffolding. We pick up information. I think it was Romans 120, which talk about the importance of the house. In order to build, you have to build a house. The house has to become a home, and the home has to have moral spaces, ethical spaces, and, and aesthetic spaces in order to be attractive enough to keep people there. Again, John, who is not here, I would have said, John, you're my, my religious authority. Yeah. And he would set me right, straight. But I'm not a religious person. But what I am is a psychiatrist, and I understand the importance of moral development in people's lives in order to overcome loss of grief. And so um, the next slide, we're going to talk about what I call ethopoiesis, the ethopoietic representation of the Lord's Prayer in, in, in human history. And, and I'll talk about it more when we get there. But the house becomes very important because the house... <coughs> We have to explore the house to try to figure out what spaces are there in the house. And it's like exploring the house. This is a bedroom. This is a kitchen. This is a that. This is a this. And along the way, the, that labeling, we begin to give it cultural meaning. And we begin to have experiences being in that house which are ethical and at spaces that we provide for that house, it being in that house. So the, the element that we talk about in terms of autonomy, we talk about discursive normalization, the naming of things, the random naming of things. Discursive normalization, which we call edX speed, is sometimes meaningless because you may go into a room and everybody says, well, this is a bedroom. But the bedroom may mean one thing to you and it may mean something else to somebody else. It's after a period of time after you've lived with that person and you've created that moral space that the bedroom begins to take on a certain specific meaning. You know these 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 um these laws these moral laws that we all are aware of that are religious laws that tell you you can only <coughs> eat certain foods you can only do certain activities in a certain specific way in a certain specific way. these were laws to keep us as a people safe. It was to allow us the chance to go and to take care of ourselves and take care of other people. So 
in 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 the in the in the uh, in the uh, nom in the nomenclature of of, of the civil uh, group problem, the house becomes very important as a metaphor. Uh, the house becomes an important metaphor because the house becomes a home. The house <coughs> has ethical spaces, aesthetic spaces, and and moral spaces that we require in order to live there and to thrive. Also, in learning to figure out where the house is and what the house can provide, it requires us to explore the house and to develop a conscious understanding of what the house can provide. And there's actual there's actual way of running through the house, naming things, and we develop a construction where, where we lay, in labeling the house, we begin to create those spaces that are very important in terms of managing our losses, not only of our own, but others. In previous lectures, we talk about the inframing nature of language. We also talk about language as having a sort of a constitutive function because it creates its own meaning. Um, one of the other things that we are going to talk about in future lectures, this is called systemization versus empathy which is a very important part of, of, of how we, 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 we learn about things and how we organize those spaces in order to take care of ourselves and take care of other people. So, again, I am not a religious scholar, but since I was five years old, I knew this prayer, and it's been part of my life forever. And I even say, anytime I'm in trouble, before I go to sleep, I said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So again, the house is a recurring construct. It's what uh, McCollum, uh, in reviewing uh, 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 Foucault's Asquises, will have talked about the ethnopoiesis of, of, of language. Now this is poetry, this is poetry, and this is poetry that in, in any era you live in, it has meaning. This poem had meaning for me when I was a five-year-old kid. I didn't understand it fully, but I and I answered, but I, I knew it was important. As a, as a as a as a developmental psychiatrist, it has meaning to me right now because our entire program in Lost and Grief, we we talk about the importance of moral morality. We talk about aesthetics, aesthetic intimacy, giving you a chance to create moral spaces. The moral spaces through generativity and support gives you a chance to create the routines and habits of others. And by asceticism, you are able to allow people to develop and to take care of God's creation, which is to give each one of us a chance to occupy that moral space where we can take care of each other. Intimacy in five acts. So the house becomes very important. And, and you know, basically we are going to talk about the importance of moral <coughs> force becoming moral power and how it's important to track that, that, that transition and what it means. So what, is, what, what do you think uh, thy rod and thy staff is referring to? When when uh, when the when the Lord's Prayer they said Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. So what is a rod used for by a shepherd? What is the what what is a shepherd? Uh, uh, what is how does he use a rod? How does he use a rod? How does he use a staff? What is a shepherd to guide them? Like keep them in pro them along in 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 a in a, in a, in a uh, more direction. Morality. That's it. So yeah. this, this to me, this is the moral statement. So thy I rod mean. and thy staff, they comfort me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the foundational piece for relationships. That moral space. That moral space is very important. Because it requires, it requires rules and regulations and, 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 and commitment and responsibility, acting responsible in a more responsible way to our fellow citizens. Not to poison their water. To create justice, to create a space of justice for them, and and that that moral space is very important, even in, in terms of our individual relationship. Morality, as I used to construct it back in the day, I used to talk about the, the importance of um, of relationships and morality. Morality was about relationships, whereas ethics have to do with uh, governmental relationships. How do you respond to the larger community? But even on a one-to-one -one basis, we have a moral obligation to each other. To take care of each other, to be kind to each other. 
to, um, to love each other, to create an intimate space where we can grow and, and achieve great things. And it's, it, 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 it just overwhelms me how people are, are not kind. Even when you're necessarily kind to them, they're not kind to you per se. And, and, and for me, I am always amazed at that. And, and uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time just praying and I look. I'm not. I'm not. I'm a lot of big, big, big religious kind of guy. I, but I am a Christian. I, I love God. I know God loves me. And I spent a lot of time talking with God. And I, the other day, I was having this conversation. I said, God, you know, I said, you know, if I didn't have all this stuff here, I'd be out of here, in New York second. I'd be in New York City because that's my home. He said, but you, you've given me resources that I can stay here and deal with people that I don't necessarily agree with half the time. And, and I just am here, you know, and uh, it's one of, uh, one of the funny things that happened to me recently. I lost a job recently, and I was thankful to losing that job. Job paid $100,000, and I lost it, but I was happy. I was happy because it was for schmutz. The people who I was working with, they, 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 had, they saw no, no value in me as a human being. And they didn't understand what I was trying to do. And it took a lot of my time and a lot of my energy. And the truth of the matter, with that money, I used to take that money and just give it away. I'm not saying this to, so that you think that I'm a wonderful and nice guy, but I think every human being that I know does this. In this room or right around here, there are people of us, there are some of us who give away stuff all the time, who take care of other people, who sacrifice for other people. Where are their parents? I know in my life I've had wonderful people sacrifice for me. Time and time again. You know, one of the one of the stories I always tell about my mom is that when I was in medical school, she would give me <laughs> the last year of her of my school, she would give me 80% of her salary. 80% of her salary. And I looked at her and I said, There's nobody. I said, I couldn't do that. I'm not gonna give up my 80% of my salary to anybody. <laughs> but she did it. John said to tell you the the house reference. It's Proverbs 24, 3 to 5. Who said John said that? Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Thank you. But <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, John, you live. I said, John, I, I struggle here, man. You give us feedback, John. But wish you well, brother. Wish you well. In any event, um, that's where we're at. So thy rod and thy staff, they comfort you. Now, how, how many people view mor moral rules and re regulation as comforting? I was going to say, I was going to say that when you mentioned when you mentioned how you lost the job or what have, whatever, um, in my opinion, when I, when, I, when I read that that rod and my staff, when we're talking about you know God, I think it means a cause and effect because I mean, if God has rule over the universe, you know He instills that cause and effect, which basically is order. So I think that. It's like a um, evening out of things. So when you say you lose the job and you're not worried about it, um, maybe it's because, well, you, you know that, you know, in some way that's, you know, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, that's going to be okay and that, you know, overall it's a good thing that that happened. It's a so, gift from God, Devin. Come on. Well, God works well, in mysterious ways. Wonders oh, but, but you got to understand, we all have freedom. I think that's the bottom line for me. It's not a question of, 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 of the choices I made. I worked at that job for a long time, even though I didn't like it. Because I truly thought that I was doing good, the right, good, thing. The right thing. As a matter of fact, I'm in a relationship with a lot of people that, that I shouldn't be in a relationship with them. But I'm in there in those relationships because I don't know why I'm there, but I, uh, God wants me in there. I, I don't know. And when, when, when God tells me it's time for me to move on, I'll move on. Um, so, well, Aubrey, yeah. when you say the, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, isn't that a reference to the Bible? Isn't that a reference to the Bible and in him giving us those words? But who's, who, who has the rod? Life? Who has the rod? Who has the staff? The shepherd. And who is the shepherd? shepherd? God. God. And God is guiding us. With he's his not, Bible, with his, he's with his, with his us rod. Right, and so he's telling us where to go, what to do, what not to do, what to say, what to, you know. And he tells us and, that. And, and, and in a loving way, he's trying to guide our choices. But mm -hmm. if, 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 as a, if as a sheep we run away and we go someplace else, God is going to come and get us. And there are other, you know, John, he knows that there are other scriptures that talk about this. About the prodigal son. About the sheep that gets lost. 
and the and the, the shepherd going and searching for that one sheep that got is lost and bringing him back into the fold and providing a home and a house for that. So again, I am not a religious guy per se, but I do use the the ethnopoesis of of, of the religious uh, text to guide my my understanding of loss and grief. Yes. So. Um, so, so that becomes a very important part. The Lord's Prayer is very important. And I swear, I swear, I swear, I swear, this has been one of the most important prayers in my life. When I have problems, I say this, I say the Lord's Prayer and I go to sleep and I wake up and I dance. Yeah. I wake up and I dance. Um, so bargaining versus acceptance. Again, both inform choices. And it's all ontological. People are people look at my program and they say, "Well, bargaining is all bad, acceptance is all good." No, but human beings, we we always bargain. We go into a certain area, we always bargain. We always bargain. We always bargain. I bargain all the time, but at some point you have to stop bargaining and accept. And that is that is what stoicism is all about. Stoicism is acceptance. As Kesis is accepting the other person as they are, in order to give them the agency to become who they're going to become. So uh, again, bargaining is bargaining is necessary. We increase knowledge. For example, uh, the empathy gene, which is what I'm reading right now in the Science of Evil. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful book, uh, the Science of Evil and Empathy and the Origins of Cruelty by Simon Baron Cohen. Uh, the other book that I'm looking at is looking at the progression of of human society from kind of a, a prehistoric to a historic. Uh, transition mm -hmm. uh, and the, the book by George Osterdekoff and he, he introduced a term called the um, uh, the structured genetic sociology and I'm beginning to read it because it talks about the importance of socialization in terms of, 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 of human society yes about this the bargaining with it being necessary not to get really narrow but how, like, you know, serious, or not serious, wrong word, how, like, you know, how far should we take it when we come to bargaining? Because if you bargain too much in life, at some point, people are just going to cut you loose. I mean, that's kind of why Tiffany's in the position. She's no, no push, no push, no, no push, no push, no push, I know. Try, try, try. I know, I know. I know, but you get what I'm I saying, though. Yeah, but, that's... but no personal information. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, um, Bargaining is very important because it's discursive normalization, it's naming the house. Without that process or that fox intimacy of running around and naming stuff, kids love it. You take a, you take a, a kid running around the house naming things and, 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 and acquiring language. It's the most exciting thing in their life. There's power there. And then you, you know, people look at them and say, oh, well, he's so smart. Why do I want to quacker? Why do I want to quacker? Such a smart, such a smart little baby, he can talk. <laughs> And so, and so you project all sorts of things onto this wonderful talking little creature. But that creature has to evolve and develop a social consciousness that, that goes through those it's seven stages of mastery where there's force and there's learning taking place to power onto that where again there's force but learning takes place which forces you into relationships because of the prosecutorial anxiety and your fear of being completely consumed and destroyed. Now, in the master-slave relationship, you give up some of the prosperity anxiety for depressive anxiety. I have to obey the rules of, of, of my master, my father, my God, my country, my community, the police officer who's acting in an ethical manner. And that's stoic, stoicism. That's, well, that's stoicism, stoicism. Yeah, acceptance. acceptance. And that's the first, that's the first stage of power, true power. Okay. It's it's acceptance. Acceptance. And that's where you begin to experience for the first time, you know, everybody walking around here yes. thinking I'm driving this wonderful car, I have all this money in my pocket, it means nothing. But that's, I think I'm getting it, it a little nothing. bit because, you know what, when you don't accept things and you, you don't have any control, that does give you prosecutorial anxiety. Yeah. Well, you see, the, th the wonderful thing, you know, there, there are two great philosophers that uh, are relevant to this discussion at this point. One has to do, it has to do with ascesis. For Colt to talk about ascesis, another great philosopher, uh, Schopenhauer, talk about ascesis. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the be, it's being in a space where you take yourself out of the equation and you just allow somebody else to be. Because the minute you put yourself into the equation, we had two lectures ago we talked about this. The importance of ascesis in allowing someone to be. 
Because the minute you are becoming, you you can you can destroy people. The minute I I start to sit around and to think about people and how craven mm -hmm. they are and how stupid they are and how mm -hmm. vicious they are, mm -hmm. and uh, I think John, uh, you know, or they, 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 back in the day, my mom would say they like uh, they're they're uh, they're uh, they're they're, they're uh, yahoos, mm -hmm. and you would form the yahoos. There are people who walk around here. You go to the shop. They just walk around here, uniform. You think that they are respectful and kind and caring, but they're they're awful. Yeah, they're void of they're, they're void authority. of any kind of moral authority, yeah. empathy, uh, compassion. Right, and so you deal with these folks constantly. I do constantly, and you constantly say, "My God, what am I doing here with these folks?" Right. <laughs> you know, and so and so this question of nominalization. You know, discussion of normalization is naming things and understanding that it's a lot of it is random nonsense. And speech has to go from edic speech, EDIC speech, to idostic speech, to eidetic speech. And it's idostic speech where you begin to have the cultural import guiding language to eidetic speech where you're able to visualize memory, visualize yourself with those speech, have those experiences, and accept. And you begin to have language be um, constitutive in, in being able to create real new meaning. Okay, so basically bargaining is very important because we, we increase our understanding, we increase our understanding, we, we increase our knowledge. Uh, uh, discursive normalization helps us to explore our home under construction, recognize harm, uh, uh, recognize what makes us feel disgusted, Mm -hmm. so it also informs us what what to avoid, what mm -hmm. things what to avoid. So that's all. That's part, part what what uh, what uh, bargaining does. But again, bargaining has its own downside. You know, we I we always talk about the paralysis of analysis, which limits being because you constantly consider things. Well, I need to do one more experiment. I need to do one more of this. I have to give this guy one more chance. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you keep going on and on and on. So. You're constantly seeking truth by acquiring knowledge, by utilizing speech or of discursive normalization, and you never accept anything. You know, and so that becomes Except a very part. Except the fact that it, things are how they actually are. Right. Instead of how you imagine them to right. be or want them to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people with edX speech, they, 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 they recognize a pattern very early. And they mm -hmm. like that pattern, they stick with it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we talk of systemization. Systemization is when people begin to recognize a pattern. They like that pattern, you know. Uh, so, so one of my my favorite guy. I love Donald Trump, man. I don't know what I'm going to do when he goes away. He <laughs> he in, in in the nineteen early nineteen nineties he accused six five African American one Hispanic young man of raping a girl. It was a vicious crime, and I was very ashamed when it when it happened. I said, boy, we are really you know people are talking about uh, uh, the, these young predators. So they got those kids, and they forced uh, they forced they forced conviction, and they and they were sentenced to jail. And then years later, DNA evidence, DNA evidence and, and a confession exonerated them. The city settled with those boys because they had taken away their lives, essentially. And the city, I think, gave them like forty-one million dollars. Donald Trump still refuses to accept the verdict and to Just allow those kids wrong. to be. Really? Innocent. He accepted, and this is what I want to address. Even with DNA evidence? Even with DNA experience and the fact that everybody, the prosecutor, everybody, and, and this is the fellow who now has the moral authority where 45 percentages in some states back him. They don't care what he That is scary. scary. And that fits in with our program. We call it, we call it the Andy Skeezoid like Paranoid Position, Position 1. You know, and so again, you know, historically we talked about this program being developed and the response to the Obama presidency, which just shocked me. And I had to go back and I had to pick up Melanie Klein's stuff and try to figure out what, what would, you know, what. Because I recognize the behavior because I'm a, I'm a child and I listen to a psychiatrist, a forensic psychiatrist, and I recognize this crazy pattern. And I said, but these are the adults. They shouldn't be behaving, behaving like this way. But then you recognize that in terms of, 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 of um, intellectual processing of information, 75 to 80 percent of Americans are at a very concrete operational level. They're, we're not deep thinkers. It's a fact. Most Americans are, are low information uh, consumers of information.
and we tend to follow herd. We tend to follow. We, we, there's a lot of there's a lot of confirmational bias. There's a lot of false intimacy, false intimacy that goes along with edict speech. Oh, I'm going to put all of these people here. I'm going to do all of this to this person. I'm going to do all of this to that person. It, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is really, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, so basically, you've got to be careful about about uh, about about not accepting because what that does, it, it puts it in a place of false intimacy, trutherism, and confirmational bias. And uh, I walk into a space, and people know me because they've seen me before. You know, I mean, I was, and I, I told this story with myself being on uh, an, an airline, you know, and I sat there, I got on, I followed rules, got on, sat in the seat, I sat next to a couple, they were waiting for their daughter, who never joined them in the flight, by the way. And I said, I'm getting up from a seat, I follow all your rules. She got, he got in here with his wife, I just, this is my seat. And they said, well, you and so they pulled me out, and they got, the, uh, they got their, uh, they got the supervisor to come and intervene and say, well, what's happening here? And they said, and one of the, one of the stewardesses said, you know, we know you. We've had problems with you before. I said, you don't know me. What do you know me from? Mm -hmm. What she knew about me was I was black. And she could invoke dangerousness to label me. And to have harm accrue to me. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I had to disabuse them very quickly. And they said, look, I, I, I understand this. This is why you have a spate of black men being shot where people invoke dangerousness in order to limit them mm -hmm. and to control them and to, and to justify how you want to treat them. You know, and, and I understand that, but, 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 but I'll be very careful. So it's very important that you then move on from bargaining to acceptance because when you bargain, you engage in this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, discursive normalization and, and confirmational bias where you see somebody who makes certain assumptions about them. You know, and, and we've, we've had experiences like this constantly. My mom used to tutor a young fellow, actually went to, went, ended up going to Harvard. Mm -hmm. But he was sitting, black kid, sitting on a bus, going to a, a, a high-end high school in, in New York. He was a scholar. And he was sitting on the bus, some other kid threw a stone through the window. The cops jumped on the bus. They looked around. We saw the black kid pull him off the bus. He said, you are obviously the one who did this. And so they took him to the station. This is a kid coming from, he was one of those high end high schools. But the only thing that the cop knew about him was a black kid. Right. So they brought, him to the, they brought him to the police station in Brooklyn. And, and the, the, the cop who was there, the, 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 the supervising officer, saw the mom come through the door. And she was like, she was like a, a bear. It was a mama <laughs> bear. She was ready to tear somebody's head off. And the, the, the supervising cops saw what was happening, said, let the kid go. I don't need to know anymore. And she wouldn't tolerate And she, she, she just came, she just, she was, and she was just ready to, ready to take anybody on. Black Lives Matter, because a lot of black kids, black people get killed very badly. This is a country where you have 10,000 towns called sundown towns, where if you were black, you had to get out by sundown. And the people who enforce those uh, rules and regulations are well, cops. And order. So the cops have a real difficult um, history, and and they need to get the, to get a chance to know themselves. So stoicism is the level of conscious development which marks the start of the acquisition of true power. It involves acceptance. It, it involves acceptance and not acting out. It's, a, it's being able to live with less intimacy in your life. We all want intimacy. We want to have money. We want to have nice this. We want to have nice that. But it's willingness to accept stuff and move on. But it, it, it's a place where you have to deal with less and less intimacy. Now, the next step, step five in, in conscious development, this is from Hegel, by the way, is about skepticism. I, I call it feeling your oats, being a wise ass. And that, that represents me, guilty as charged. But it's, it's about creating those intimate spaces for yourself. When you're doing the right thing, you, you're taking care of what you're supposed to take care of. You, you're following people's rules, but you're having fun with them. You know, and so, and, and that's because everybody needs intimacy. 
we all seek intimacy and this and skepticism is a chance for us to uh, imbue our, whatever social relationship we have with a certain level of intimacy and so that's skepticism and I, I, I'm always I'm always rec- trying to recognize that as my kids who are, who are living on the difficult circumstances you could see them it's like looking at a storm blow into your space you could see them evolve in their social consciousness the acceptance of skepticism and that okay I accept whatever you want to do is fine with me I don't care and they they just uh, and then after that they become like the wise ass they start wearing different clothes they're acting in a kind of they all down the bag of chip but they follow the rules they're not they're not challenging you they say I'm gonna do it Papi, don't call me Papi. What do you want me to call you, man? What do you want me to call you? I didn't call you anything you want me to call you. But you, 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 you're the man. <laughs> call me, Mr. Tell me, Mr. Smith. Okay, Mr. Smith, what do you want me to put in this box? Skepticism. They're having fun with it. Now, the truth of the matter is that if 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 you are an adult and you and you recognize this in, in somebody you're dealing with. You may not recognize it. Some people do. Some people, just folk wisdom, realize that this kid is just trying to move on to a phase where he's going to have some control over a situation. But some people see it as just being somewhat <coughs> contrarian and being difficult. And so they may, they may gang up and want to beat you down because you're engaging in some skepticism. And that's what humor is about, by the way. Making fun of people, having fun with them. That's, that's what humor is about. And the, the, the Greeks talk about it as mimesis and anti-mimesis, mm-hmm. art imitating life, life imitating art. It's the idea of how do you cope with loss. And skepticism, art, is a big part of that process. Mm-hmm. And so um, then we go on to um, the unhappy consciousness. The unhappy consciousness, where ascesis is very important. Because you realize that by taking yourself out of the equation, you give people a chance to develop and to be who they're going to be. You know, the unhappy constant, giving people what they need. You're not necessarily happy about it, mm-hmm. but you do it anyway. And then the final, the final, <coughs> the final level of conscious development has to do with uh, rational choice, where we're doing the right things because we understand the power of love. Now, along the way, in order to acquire a um, certain level of conscious understanding of things, we have to go t- through something which we call cosmopolitanism, and this is a big part of our program. And we actually had someone write little um, little misses and highlight certain people that we call our cosmopolitan mm-hmm. page. And that cosmopolitan has to do with the acceptance of others. Intimacy in five acts. Going from moral force to moral power. And ascesis and acceptance. Mm-hmm. So basically, cosmopolitanism is recognizing the sameness and diversity. Xenia, Philea, Agape. A power now evolves whereby we begin to accept the other and others as having value and purpose. That's cosmopolitanism. That's why I love New York City. I go in New York City, man, people may not know who I am, but there's a certain level of acceptance there that I don't necessarily appreciate when I'm, let's say, in the Inland Empire. You know. I just don't. It's a fact. I love New York City. I have cathedrals. I just feel I just feel better. It's a whole different world. Uh, so being and becoming becomes very important. And you have to go through a, a series of, of stages where you have to accept. It may require ascesis. It may require that you become somewhat cosmopolitan. And the key thing about cosmopolitanism is that you have to somehow reject your own group. Cosmopolitanism means that you reject your own group. So, for example, one of the things I love about, uh, like, for example, Clint Eastwood, the pale writer, he was an outsider constantly. Have you noticed that? Clint Eastwood mm-hmm. was always the outsider. Yeah, in his movies. In his movies. Jazz musician. Mm-hmm. But he grew up in San Francisco, but so he came by that naturally. But jazz musician. Beautiful jazz musician. You know, he, he appreciated the arts. Yeah. He was able to give me an understanding of my own history with music. Uh, John Coltrane loved country and western music. 
the next John Poetry. Why do you like country and western music? I think I got it. I know I got it somewhere. I got it somewhere. He says, man, they tell a good story. And I, I like a good story. A good narrative. Cosmopolitanism, accepting others by will, be willing to uh, reject your own identity in order to en enhance your reach to everybody. Now, there's some complications which comes with uh, with uh, just with, with, with comes with just accepting and, and 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 so some of the complications we have are of course we have object use, creative destruction, um, and and these things we have to manage. You know. I always talk about it. in every relationship there's a fire. In between any two human beings there's a fire. And you have to learn to manage that fire. And behavior helps you to manage that fire. If the fire is managed appropriately, then the fire is turned all the way down. And what you get from that relationship is the light. To see each other, to give each other the things you need to give each other. Because light becomes the important element in that relationship. But by the same token, if you don't manage that fire and the fire goes up to a rip roar, then all you get is the heat. You don't necessarily see that person as they are, all you see is some kind of distorted view of who that person is. And so that becomes a very, so you have to be able to manage the complications of relationships, even cosmopolitanism. So moral development, again, requires you going from moral force of mastery, power unto death, and even getting involved in a master-slave relationship to actually um, um, stoicism, where you're beginning to be willing to accept less intimacy in order to to progress and to grow. And the only way, the only reason you can accept less intimacy is because you're growing internally. You're growing internally. Again. Intimacy is about value, sympathy, and empathy. Our sense of value, our sense of our own value informs our choices in acting or not acting. You know, sometimes it's important not to act as it is to act. You gotta know when to choose your battles. You gotta know when to choose your battles. And then when to fight. You know what you know what you know when to become ascetic, ascesis, being able to take yourself out of a situation and simply support other people. Because if I, if I were to challenge every time, if I were to challenge somebody every time I know that they're full of gear, <laughs> yeah. it would be in a very difficult situation. You'd be exhausted, huh? Oh, not, not how am I doing? I'm not cursing as much. Have you noticed that? It's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I just pulled a Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, so, um, again, yeah. conflict is ever present. We just have to come up with ways of managing it. And, and moral development and more force to moral power is how we manage that, okay? So summary by way of word cloud. Moral force to moral power. Moral force to moral power. We all deal with force initially in the level of mastery, in the level of power unto death. Even with master slave relationship, we deal with power. We, have, we get into a relationship with somebody that can, that can destroy us. They have the power of death. We, we simply want to give up some of the prosecutorial anxiety in order to assume the press of anxiety where we can manage it a bit better. The press of anxiety you can manage because you have some, some control over it. That's Melanie Klein stuff, man. I think Melanie Klein is a goddess. I think she's great. And I, and I give her props. Um, again, the important thing in Hegelian transition is towards a rational choice. Again, choice always, always, even bad choice informs our actions. And a lot of times people make bad choices and they make bad decisions. Now, aesthetic intimacy in our program is very important. Aesthetic intimacy is, is being able to give someone that primary narcissistic foundational piece where they have good value and understanding of themselves as being valuable. And if they feel valuable, they can make you feel valuable because they're able to reciprocate. Yes. And it becomes a mirroring experience, a mirroring experience, a mirroring gene. I know, um, I know we're talking about loss and grief, but when you when you talk about choice, what do you say about um, our instinct controlling how we think before we decide? So before we make before we have, take an action, what do you say about our brains basically uh, giving us what we need to make? 
to uh, take an action or have a behavior. You know what I mean? What a lot of times, a lot of times, we 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 we, are, we we tend to be low information actors sometimes, and that's what I talked about in previous lectures as as fragmentation. You know, fragmentation. Oh, yeah. When you make you figure that to overcome loss, you have to make a quick decision. And one of the things that we were trying to promote in anger management communication solutions is the idea that you don't have to act very quickly with anything, really. Yeah. And so, so one of the when I was uh, when I was a, a, a medical officer, I, I tell it all the time. <laughs> when, I, when I was a medical officer at uh, at, at, at Van Nuys uh, precinct, I used to we used to do uh, pre-booking uh, medical evaluations. And I had a nurse who was an instructor in, uh, in, in, uh, in um, advanced life supports. And, 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 and so one day this person, she, he saw this person, the person was passed out. And he wanted immediately to apply a... Uh, Chest compression. No, no, you oh, mean oh, uh, electrodes. Uh, uh, flip and shock him. Yeah, flip yeah. I said, what uh, are you doing? <laughs> Get it myself. I said, what are you doing? I said, what are you doing? I said, and he says, well, I said, listen, man, it takes time for somebody to die. If you're going to die that quickly, you're going to be dead anyway. So get over yourself. I think you can do the right thing. You can get vital signs. You can talk to people who have seen the patient before, and you can make some informed decisions. Do an assessment. For you can do an assessment. A quick assessment. An assessment. And I said, man, if I ever have a problem, you keep that <laughs> away from me. You know, and that's because, and human beings do that. We tend to, we, 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 we feel, too quick. We, we fragment. We, we, we fragment. Fragmentation is when you're trying to overcome loss very quickly. And that's when you make mistakes. Utilizing limited information and speed of action. Mm -hmm. And the only way you get, get away from fragmentation is developing transactional agency. We are able to pay attention, act intentionally, know what you're trying to accomplish, and know your role vis-a-vis -vis other people. You know, and so people people's choices a lot of times are informed by bad uh, by bad informational streams. Usually, fragmented. You think they know more than they know, and actually, they're. Their information is wrong. But but part but part of what part of part of the informational stream that they use is 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 bias, confirmational bias. Mm -hmm. So one of these confirmational biases that we've been having to deal with is the idea that black lives really don't matter. Mm -hmm. So the corollary is that black lives do matter. Because there's the assumption that black lives do not matter. I mean it's a painful, painful realization. But when you realize that that, 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 when you're dealing with other people, when you realize that you've got no value to those people, it is one of the most devastating things you can feel as a human being. But the only way you can deal with it is through moral power. Moral power. Stoicism. Understanding where you are in that process. And so, and so that becomes a very important part of what we do. Now, one of the things that we, 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 we have been trying, one of the things we were working on developing is something which we call anger management communication solutions in 3D. We're talking about um, the shield. Uh, um, uh, the shield. And so I have, in our protocols, we have the shield. We have a shield. We have three shields. Uh, I think this is a hoplite shield, this is a, this is a Spartan shield, and this Medieval. is a Roman shield. I think this is a, a Roman uh, military shield. And we all have all of these shields sitting on top of the table. And we have anger management communication solution as one of those shields that sits on the table with these other Roman shields. And for me, this is, a, this is like a metaphor, if you will, for the idea that uh, in order to shield the community, to shield ourselves, we have to sometimes develop uh, cognitive skills, which is implicit in our protocols of anger management communication solution treaty. And, and, and one of the, the, the things is to be mindful and to know where you are in a communication cycle. Where you are. And so we talk about the three Ds of communication, communicating and managing loss and grief and anger. Diatribe. You have to always recognize when you're in a diatribe. If, if diatribe is about a statement of loss, 
a statement of loss. And usually what happens is one turn deserves another. So when somebody says, I've lost this, and he's like, I've lost more. You're not communicating with each other. You're not going to solve any problem. When you begin to trade stories about who has more loss and what you have done to hurt me and so forth and so on. You always have to move the 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 the, uh, the, um, the conversation, the communication from diatribe to discussion. And in discussion, you're not solving any problems. You just give people a chance to, in a very reasonable way, state what their concerns are. Vent. To vent. Uh, to vent. To vent yeah. But it's not just to vent, but to show that you're cognitively attuned to what it is that causes you to to feel that you've lost. Okay. And so that is that is that is a discussion piece. Again, you're not solving anything during a discussion. Mm -hmm. And then you go from a discussion to a dialogue. And a dialogue, you're not necessarily solving any any problems during a, a dialogue either. Mm -hmm. Because the conditions might not be right for you to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. But you can go to another place that as a holding place where you can begin to work on solving the problem. And that's an accommodation. You know, we're gonna accommodate each other. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna agree to disagree, but we will treat each other with respect and kindness. And that's the foundation of of, of any relationship, whether it's a business relationship or a personal relationship or a, a daughter son relationship. Yeah. You know, so yeah, so, that's so a foundation. This, yeah, so that that's a foundational piece. So our next lecture is going to be on um, November, 9th. November 9th. And what we're going to do is to explore the same construct with under loss and grief on moral sentiment and looking at what, what rules govern a uh, relationship between people mm -hmm. and the importance of morality. One of the things that, that, that I've experienced with a lot of kids is that you know people come to me and say, you know, this kid is stealing and lying. And, and acting in a in a disreputable manner, mm -hmm. and and I, and I would say, yeah, that's because there's some problems there with their moral their 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 their, their moral integration, mm -hmm. and a lot of it has to do with secondary narcissism. Primary narcissism is having good self-esteem and, and a good sense of yourself, and usually that is created through aesthetic intimacy, where your parent or people in your life value you and let you know that they value you. That's, that's where you create that pot of gold. And that pot of gold lasts us all our, our entire lives. And then you run into life where you run into a world full of yahoos, people who would treat you less than. But even doesn't really matter because once you have those foundational pieces in place, you can probably survive most stuff. You just have to look at how your empathy is eroded and what factors erode your empathy, your ability to feel sympathy, and to act in a reasonable way, and to have double think when you think of people. You know, um, one of the one of the interesting things is in this book, um, um, the science of evil by uh, Simon Baron Cohen. John, we need to create uh, 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 an expanded page where we put these books up, yeah. and we got. I'll try to summarize them. So, but so I think we we've, we've, we, we, we yeah we got a book we got a series of books that are wonderful. I think. And, and they're growing. I think I've got like about 12 or more in, in that in yes, library. So we got to do something with that. We talked about it before, John. John is not here tonight. He is, he is our spiritual leader. He is our, <laughs> he is our moral force here, usually. And he's not here tonight, and we wish him well. In any event, um, questions. We're going to open it up. Well, moral development. Well, that's what your parents give you at the very beginning. And I guess if if there is no one there to to help start you in that direction, um, where would you get that from? Where where would you develop? Where where would you get your moral development from? If there is no one there to you. take you to church, to start you in that direction, because with me at the beginning. At, Will do, Dr. King. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no one there to start you in that direction, where where would you get your moral development from? Moral sentiment. One of the things I'm going to explore in our last our next lecture is uh, the importance of moral sentiment. You know, the uh, one of the other books I'm re reading right now is by by uh, Jonathan Haidt, and it's called the Righteous the Righteous Mind, the Righteous Mind. Human beings tend to be very very moralistic. We're always searching for rules. 
the guide our behavior. And we're always trying to find patterns that gives us justification for our actions and our belief system. Um, one of the things that, uh, that, 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 that you have to keep in mind is that human beings tend to be moral. We have a moral compass. But it all started as a moral force. And hopefully it becomes moral power, which ex is expansive and includes constructions such as cosmopolitanism, where we begin to recognize the oneness in our diversity. You know, the oneness in our diversity. We all live in houses. We all eat. We all want the best for our kids. We all want a, a society that's just. And we all from the human race. And all from the human race. You know, and, and we, all, we all want intimacy as we get older. We all want to have a sense that we are being cared for and loved and cherished and valued. You know, um, one of my experiences that, that set me on this course is uh, when I was a fellow, well, not fellow, it's post, post, post fellowship here at Patton State Hospital. I had a one, 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 um, one female um, resident of the, the Patton State Hospital. She was very, very violent, but she wasn't violent to me. And because she wasn't violent to me or, or threatened me, uh, the, some of the staff felt resentful because I thought that I was all that in the bag of shit because I had this relationship with this 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 woman who was very, very assaultive to them. And, you know, I, I smiled at that because there was I had no information that, 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 that they didn't have. I don't think that they had. The only thing I brought to the table was the fact that I grew up in Brooklyn. And I realized that the easiest thing you could give somebody is respect and caring and, and, and a sense of That's caring for them. a whole bunch of stuff. If you're just nice to somebody, it's the start of a great seduction. Mm -hmm. You can't seduce anybody unless you're nice to them. That's where it starts. That's what you said. You give them their own agency, right? You like, give them their own agency. You know, make them feel that they, they are somebody. That they, they are somebody. They an they aesthetic, aesthetic intimacy. They it's got Aesthetic value. intimacy. Yeah. It's being nice to somebody. Just because they're human. Because they're human being. You know, and, and, and being able to give them things that they want and to, to be a friend to them. You know, I learned that when I, when I work at Juvenile Hall and some of my, some of my, my young juvenile uh, offenders, you know, I realized early on in dealing with them is that if I was just nice to them and just be, you know, find find them, be real. I am real in the sense that I'm kind of off the wall, off the chain crazy half the time. And I, I call that kabuki there. <laughs> but it, it's a sense of giving intimacy. It's that discursive normalization, which is you explore different aspects of your own brain. You know, one of the worst things you can do in terms of therapy, uh, they, I'm telling you, if you have a therapist, be very careful of any therapist that wants you to go through this kind of linear, uh, 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 because eventually you're going to get bored and you're going to leave that therapeutic relationship. The best, the best therapists are those that are intimate. Meaning they, they present scenarios where you go all over and you explore all, of, all your brain. All different parts of your brain light up and you begin to see the connectivity between different aspects of your brain. That is intimacy. That is true intimacy. It's biological. It's circuits where by discursive normalization you explore different aspects of, of your life. If you, if, you want, if you want to explore your home, you, you don't want to spend all your time in your bedroom. Well, maybe you do, but... <laughs> <laughs> New one was coming. But, but you want to be able to... You want to be able to explore your home. You want to go to the den. Enjoy the backyard. You want to go to the, the backyard. Yeah, the you know, eventually you said, I, I can't stay all my life in this one bedroom here. Yeah. I have to go to the kitchen. Yeah. I, want, to I, want, I want to go to the backyard. I want to go have a barbecue. I want to sit and have some tea. I want to go to the salon and listen to some nice music, some Bach. You know, I want to be able to go to my kitchen and have a wonderful extended table with multiple people cooking a wonderful meal and then sitting together and having a wonderful meal with each other. That's exploring, that's intimacy. But you're going all over the place, you see the connectivity. The, the connectivity is the fact that once you go all over the place, you begin to see the, the human pattern and the relationships that, that are necessary for creating that intimate bond that gives value to your life, give value to other people. And that's what the morality is developed. But thanks precisely. Human beings, we are seeking that because we want to have a sense of our own. It's about joy. Yeah, I call it morality is about joy. Yeah, and then you, 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 can't, you, can't, you can't get to Overall. a place of joy 
unless you go to a space of, of, of moral rectitude and responsibility. You know, I, I, I love people who tend to show up and are faithful and are kind and are smart and are responsible and are reliable. Those are rock bed foundational pieces for happiness. People that you can't trust, people who are all over the place, they drain you. They drain you. There's nothing there. There's no passion. There's nothing there. They may think that there is, you know, people people all this way. This is all this and this, this no, it's nothing. Taking care of a human being, being able to see a human being grow and develop and mature and take on life and be, and be able to fly. The larvae becoming a butterfly. That's exciting. It is. It is. That it's is always, exciting. always amazing. Watching the, the larvae world. becoming a, a, a butterfly is exciting. Human being, being. Yeah. And to be able to see another human being thrive and, and to progress and to do great things makes you happy. You know, um, as opposed you know, to as watching them go sideways. As, as, as opposed to creating, <laughs> creating such problems in their lives that they have nothing. Yeah. That they diminish as human beings. Yeah, they're scarred because they're scarred. The environment or either the condition they was raised. Right. So. Progressive. So for me, you know, that is that is moral sentiment, and we we are trying to build towards a lecture in in uh, in um, in, in uh, Scotland, talking about moral sentiment uh, with uh, John Adams and uh, David Hume. And you know, the, we are trying to use a theme to market this book called The uh, Essential Architecture of Philosophy. Uh, who remember the movie The Last King of Scotland? I do. Yes. Great movie, but it was about it was about it was about Idi Amin and his love for the Scots in yeah. terms of their military traditions. Mm -hmm. You know, but I, I really love the Scots because of this idea of moral sentiment, the idea that that is uh, and and again, you know, as I read, you know. Jonathan Haddad's book on the righteous mind talks about that, that human beings, uh, that we want to be able to find that moral space that guides our behavior, that gives us some understanding of what we're trying to do. The problem is that a lot of, a lot of our, our, low, uh, our, our low information voters and people, citizens don't want to go any past their initial impression. They have certain impression of who you are as a person. That's all they're going to think about. Yeah. They want to stick with that because that makes them feel... Good. Yeah. Secure. Secure. You were one of them black boys. You don't want to know anything else. Nothing else. You know, and I mean, I, 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 I was sitting in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a restaurant in Cambria. <coughs> Excuse me. And I was having some fish tacos. Beautiful coastline, halfway between here and San Francisco. I love that spot because when I was a fellow at the Tascadera, I would go there when I have a down moment. And it's a wonderful place to sit, drink a beer, have a beer, have a fish taco, and just sit and think and doodle. As I was leaving that spot one evening, uh, one day in the afternoon, I ran into an older white fellow, he was about 70, 75. And I swear he looked at me like he'd just seen a rat. <laughs> well, across the well, like he was out of place. Uh, oh, like, man. He was, he was like, <laughs> What are you doing here? And, uh, and he was like, <laughs> I invaded his space. I because it was red hot hatred. Yeah, you sensed his his oh. his, his hostility. Oh. You yeah. have no place. Yeah, yeah, I had no place. I felt sad. About, I felt sad. I felt sad for myself. Yeah, because yeah. I understand how he felt about me. Yeah, but I said, damn, that is sad. Yeah, because he don't even know you. He don't, he don't, even know you. He don't even know you. This blind hatred. This blind yeah. hatred. Yeah. But he but I, but, but, the, but but the funny part of this story <laughs> is that. It was my, you know, I, 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 before then, I, before I went to Tascadera, I used to, you know, Sting was my favorite artist. So I got into my car and I began bopping Dr. Dre. Necrotic. <laughs> <laughs> Within five minutes, I was restored. <laughs> the, import, the importance of art imitating life. Life imitating art. My nieces. You know, uh, there's power there. So these, these kids running around... Rapping, a lot of it is bad stuff, but but I understand a lot of it is also interesting stuff, and so art becomes very important. And I, I love I love the Scots because you know it's the it's the, it's the Macbeth. Mm -hmm. 
and, and the, the, the last king of Scotland. Now, our program, we're going to be presenting the the last king of Scotland. Oh, the last king of Scotland. Known as, known as, 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 as S. Diogenes Johnson. Diogenes Johnson. Anyway, guys, so any other questions? No. Never time, got you. We're tired. Cool. Thank you, guys. Okay. Um, another good meeting, man. Good. Wait, before we go, I'm so sorry. With the, what you said about aesthetic intimacy right. with children, yes, how can you, he's gonna love. how do you, he's what, to pick up children. I guess what, right. um, what could you do yeah. to, um, to change that if you see, like, a child or an adolescent exhibiting, no worries, like, okay. behaviors in relation to the lack of aesthetic intimacy when they're growing, like, what, I guess, what's the point of action for, I guess, trying to reverse that? Is there? Like, when you're talking to these children and you see that maybe perhaps they're lacking something at home, what is the, what is your take or what is the... Well, aesthetic intimacy, you have to look at it at, 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 at George Blush, what it means. Aesthetic intimacy is creating an intimate space with somebody because you think they're attractive and that they're interesting. And that they have value. You know, a lot of people have secondary narcissism. Even though they, they're very attractive, they don't think they're very attractive. Have you ever run into those people? Who are beautiful and, Who are beautiful and they don't realize how beautiful they are. Because they never were told that they're beautiful. And then you have guys like me who think I'm just absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> John said, well done, Dr. King. Really? He said, well done, Dr. King. So it's called secondary narcissism? Is he well, watching the stream? He's watching the stream. He's watching the stream. He's watching the stream. He's watching I'm happy to hear that. Everything's working. <laughs> it's about primary narcissism. It's how you, it's laying down good feelings about yourself so you can have good feelings about other people. But if you, if you have, if you have uh, secondary narcissism, I mean, you never lay those feelings down. Is that like um, an inferiority complex? Like an inferiority complex. You don't think oh, you have any value. Okay, okay, okay. A lot of people go through life not feeling that they're valued. And so the key there, the key there about valuing someone is that you have to create a moral space for them. Mm -hmm. So a moral space is creating a house and living in that house for that person. There's no more, there's no greater statement of your commitment to a person than cooking for them, cleaning for them, creating a moral space where they can grow and develop. And 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 and, 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 and uh, morality is about not lying and stealing, but wanting to have a relationship. When you want to have a relationship with somebody, you don't want to lie, you don't want to steal, you don't want to hurt, you don't want to hurt them. Well, you don't want to hurt the relationship number one. Huh? Uh, it's the end of relationship itself. Right, uh, and then the relationship, relationship so, itself. You know, so more so 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 um, guys like um, like like Fairburn, you know, talked about um, human beings, and we're not seeking sexual release. We're seeking relationships. People don't get that. It just, no, they People don't, don't get that. It. Until the end. You know, they don't get it to the end. I, I am not, I am not, I am not, I am not seeking somebody with a big ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeking somebody who's kind. On the same conscious level as me. Who's hopefully. kind. Yeah. Boy, I, I crushed that. Is that a crush down bigger? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's the idea that I'm not seeking somebody with whatever aesthetic things, yeah. attribute you were talking about. I'm talking about somebody who's kind and caring. Who sees value in me? Beautiful inside. No, who sees value in me? Yeah, but the, the, the oxymoron of that is, you know, you don't develop that level of understanding until you get a certain age. Because when you when you in, in your in your early stage of growth, but it's ontological. It, it grows. It grows. Okay, I mean, okay, it starts okay. out with mastery. So when you sit, when you're a little kid, you're sitting around playing with with, with, with trucks. Yeah, yeah, and, and you have somebody, you have somebody sitting there enjoying your play. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Colin, let's go let's go get some shower. You want you to shower? What do you want to have for dinner tonight? Well, Dad, I want to have pizza. Maybe we have pizza last night. You sure you want to have pizza again tonight? What do you want to have, Dad? You know, let's have a salad. Kale? Okay. <laughs> Mass mastery. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden the kid is now taking on your worldview. Yeah. At one point, he used to like salad more than I used to like salad. Because he, he understands the value of it. And we gave him a choice. You know, he, he initially, my son preferred eating cheese toast. And and I never really shamed him about eating cheese toast. Do you kind of tell the story? Yeah, go ahead. 
So I never really shamed him about eating too. I, I would simply, I would simply have fun with him, <laughs> you know. For example, in our beautiful kitchen in the Claremont, you know, he was sitting there putting himself like three hamburgers, three hamburgers, and a pile of French fries. That sounds good. <laughs> and I, I walked out and I looked at this stuff and I said, "You yeah. sure you got enough fries?" <laughs> <laughs> hamburgers, love love. Yeah. And he looked at me. He looked at me and he began laughing. <laughs> <laughs> because he looked at he looked at the plate of food. And he, and he, said, he said he said that I get it. Dad, yeah. what do I eat now at twenty five? You don't eat a lot. You eat, no, what do I eat now? I don't know what what those big big kick. <laughs> those, 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 you like kale. Yeah, I like you kale. like kale salad. He likes kale salad. He likes kale salad. Where we go to? I like that you like kale. He likes kale salad. He eats healthy. Yeah. It's no more of this. He, I mean, we go to places like I eat the candy in the streets. He doesn't. Does yeah. anyone want sandwiches? Yes. Yes. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and end it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.